everyone and welcome back. So, it's time to go over the Cyberpunk launch day Fallout. Also, Steam have launched a new experiment and we have learned more about Bioshock 4, plus a few other things too. So, lots to cover and with that, let's get going. Cyberpunk's launch, unsurprisingly, has been bloody massive. 8 million pre-orders, 4.7 million of which were on PC. And that does mean that uh, World of Warcraft Shadowlands' 3.7 million has been quite handily beaten. So uh, there goes Blizzard's fastest selling PC game of all time uh, claim that we covered a few days ago. Now in terms of other numbers, well, 1 million Steam concurrent players, that's actually setting a new record for a single player game, soundly beating the 473k of Fallout 4, which was the previous record, but it still is short of some of the big multiplayer titles like, say, PUBG, which actually had a mind-boggling 3.26 million people concurrently at one point in 2018. So, thing here is, massive, massive pre-sales. A very high aggregate critic score, right? 91, 92. So why is it a 72 in Steam? Well, to get to the bottom of that, we've got to talk about the real-world opinions of Cyberpunk. Embargo-restricted reviews that couldn't even show actual game footage are all well and good, right? They are what they are. Many reviewers clearly love the game, but recognize the bugs and kind of still went ahead with very, very high review scores. Those scores will probably accurately represent the game well enough once those bugs are fixed, but what's that actually like now for customers who have put their cash down to support this company and get this game? Well, Cyberpunk 2077 being out in the wild means we actually know what it's like for these people, and we can really see why CD Projekt Red would not want people to show their footage, right, pre-embargo. Let's get out of here. Hello, Peter gets us to the garage direct. Good work. Shit show's over. And also why they gave out no console copies, because... My god, you're going to see some clips in a bit of what this looks like in PS4, and it's awful looking. Now, in spite of this game having, I think, one of the most diehard fan bases, I mean, whenever it comes to criticism of the game, I've seen people, you know, go to Blizzard Apologist tier, and I've seen loads of those on my other channel from time to time, um, you know, really, really go very hard in being the corporate defense force for this one. And even with that... The reviews are rough enough, 72 out of 100. Now, that is, for many games, pretty good or decent, but, you know, Witcher 3 was not ideal at launch, right? But that launched to a 93.5 in Steam, so it's not really ideal. That's just Steam. On last-gen consoles, though, things are really, really, really rough. We don't obviously have as good of a centralized place for user reviews there, but... It's a bad time for them. Do not get this game on an Xbox One or a PS4. I think the it's as simple as that. If that's the only way you can play it now, do not play it till later. Now, the Steam reviews generally do vary. Like, the anger is pretty obvious, though. It's at bugs, glitches, crashes, and performance. And on performance, NVIDIA's DLSS is basically a complete savior there. And even with that, many low to mid machines are really struggling. Um, and it's the thing there where many of the reviews are obviously positive about the game, and that is good, but it's also clear that its issues as a product are holding it back significantly. We've greatly enhanced our crowd and community systems to create the most believable city in any open world game to date. And really my feel here is that after all of the delays, a bunch of people are just fed up that this has happened, right? Now, people started compiling lists of issues into a bugs mega thread over at the Cyberpunk 2077 subreddit, only for that to be removed by the mods, which is just the sort of thing that's a bad look. Now, for a bit more of a technical view, let's head up Digital Foundry's thoughts. So the sad thing is that their first impressions video was held back by CD Projekt Red's embargo. They, of course, were not allowed to use their own footage, only the supplied B-roll. And, uh, well, that's grim for a Digital Foundry video. Now, what they actually said was interesting, and I guess is hopeful for when things are actually fixed up, because especially with ray tracing on, they actually said that to them this game looks so good that they feel that CD Projekt Red actually undersold the visuals. I mean, that is really exciting if you can eventually get a 3080 or a 3070. Um, so there's that. Now, we do have from Digital Foundry a little bit of a snippet of their initial console testing. And man, it is rough, especially the PS4, it seems. Um, or at least that's what really sort of circulated out first, but it's not good. I mean, the footage is really something. Just look at it with your eyes, right? And... 
that's the sort of thing where, to a lot of people, this was initially marketed. I mean, people are doing that comparison of the 2018 trailer versus what the game actually looks like in those consoles. And the thing is, in 2018, this was marketed as a PC, X-Bone, and PS4 game. And the difference between that trailer, and yes, it does have the disclaimer, but still, the difference between that and the actual launch version of the game is striking. I mean... The visuals are heavily downgraded. It's running, we think, like around, you know, 900p-ish, and it's hitting a regular, like, it's, it's hitting dips of 15 frames per second. 15 FPS. What, like, that's just not an okay gameplay experience. Now, we had heard some sort of rumors that it was really the PS4 and base Xbox One versions of this game that was actually responsible for a lot of what held back some of those delays. And if, if that is the case, then clearly they got this working technically, but I think not in any sense where it actually delivers people a, a product experience that's worth their money. Do not get this on those consoles. This is only a game to play, I think, right now on a high-end PC, an Xbox Series X, or a PS5. And even at that, that's only for people who've got a high tolerance for immersion-breaking bugs. I'm going to be properly jumping into it, and I'll give you my thoughts, but it's a sad situation because it seems like this is a genuinely incredible game that is just being hampered. Then another bit of CDPR news that's popped up is uh, strange and a bit sad. So Peter Sark, who is actually the uh, your breathtaking guy from that E3, um, he's actually said that CD Projekt Red have never contacted him like they said they would. He claims that he never got the free copy or access to the game that uh, CD Projekt Red said he would get, and he's not sure whether they even donated the go-kart to Gamers Outreach. So, this is a bit of a weird thing to highlight, I know it might seem like that, um, but the reason why we bring it up is because, yes, it is news that's appeared, and also, CD Projekt Red really did play into the whole, you know, breathtaking Keanu Reeves moment for their branding um, and the marketing for this game, so it just seems odd that they've then neglected some of the stuff with the guy who ended up creating for them a near-perfect meme marketing campaign, the sort of thing that you kind of can't really buy with money. Um, now, personally, I'll say this. I don't think this is them being super evil and negligent or, or whatever. I think it's just the amount of chaos that must be going on in their offices right now and over the last few months. I just have to imagine that this just got lost in the chaos of releasing a chaotic game. But still, it has certainly not garnered them the nicest headline. So where do we actually close off this cyberpunk stuff before we move on to the rest of today's stories? I think it's pretty simple, right? This is clearly a game that is losing some of its audience. I think people were asked to have a incredible amount of patience with this game, and I think that has not really been reciprocated in the quality of the product that they've got, right? And I think there's a difference between the quality of the game and the quality of the product. Game seems absolutely incredible. Product seems like it just has a whole bunch of issues. Clearly, the game deserved better. Did they just need another six months? right? I mean, that's not even a question. Clearly they did. Even the very positive reviews for this game say the game shouldn't, shouldn't be out at this stage. So what was the investor pressure like? What the hell made them think they needed to release the game in this state? Because anyone who's played a video game, and CD Projekt Red, I've played video games before, right? They all must have known that this would be a shit show. Like, obviously. So... What is what are you know what are the mechanics that, that force this out? Because we'd expect this sort of thing from EA really needing to hit their quarter. But for Cyberpunk, I, I don't really know. I thought CD Projekt Red were a good bit more independent. Strange. Strange, and I think people want answers. Okay, moving on, we've got surprise Bioshock 4 news. That's pretty hype. So, a series of new job openings have appeared at Cloud Chamber Games, and those have given us an idea of what to expect. One of them, the listing, that is, describes the game as an ambitious, narratively driven project full of character and personality, which is obviously what we would expect. But here's what's more interesting. It's looking for someone with RPG experience to help design the game's dialogue systems. And that's made a lot of people think, huh, could there be, like, branching dialogue in, in the next Bioshock? And that would certainly give them the chance to have a bit more player agency than uh, I think we've had in the past with those games, especially with Infinite. Um, you know, there was just that feeling some parts of Infinite wrong are just a little bit hollow. Also, there was mention of emergent sandbox world stuff and ambitious new things with AI in job listings. And that's all super hype. I mean... After Infinite, you know, being great, but then definitely having its issues, and then a very, very long break, I think what this franchise would really need to come back is uh, 
it's just, you know, something that really just announces, hey, I'm back, I'm Bioshock, you now matter in my narrative more, we've got, you know, just like more stuff going on. Um, so yeah, I love Bioshock, that's really exciting. Then next up, some fun from Valve. So they've actually posted a new Steam Labs experiment, and I just love covering these things because it gives us, like, just little insights into them. Now, this adds categories and a genre list, um, gives us things like, well, it adds to the genre list things like subgenres. There's also an expanded new and noteworthy section and a few other things like themes. And if you look at the themes, I think they're actually the sorts of things that are probably more useful to people, right? Because it would allow people to target games via the experience they want, rather than just mechanical genre. I mean, Call of Duty, first-person shooter. Bioshock, first-person shooter. Theme-wise, very different experiences. I could do a whole rant about genres basically being a terrible way to talk about games because they boil down just games to being just mechanics. That's not really that useful. And I think maybe that's something that Valve are realizing, and they think that this could help them, well, shift more copies on their store. They're definitely an interesting bunch, Valve, right? It's always neat to actually see how they think about problems, and one of the great things about Labs is we get a glimpse into that, and they generally explain their working out, which is just really fun and interesting. Okay, time for a bit about Destiny. It's only fair because we did cover the issues with uh, with Beyond Light, where Beyond Light, look, from a core part of the Destiny player base, there are there there is positive sentiment, and uh, in terms of like some of the stuff that's there, it is good and fun. But also a lot of criticism from people, basically over you know not enough rewards, things like that. I mean the vaulting of content. And Bungie might actually be working towards addressing this. Now, we're not going to go into a lot of specifics and detail here. We're not a Destiny channel. But the gist here is more rewards, including in seasonal content. That means things like weapons. And also a promise to have more stuff like that in future annual releases. Because Shadowkeep and Beyond Light, basically, well, they were kind of disappointing in that regard. And then also, Transmog is coming for Season 14, which will be uh, good for the fashion side of Destiny. But it's just that thing with Destiny 2 where I kind of like keeping up to date with it and following it because, um, well, it was actually the start of this channel in a way um, with the big news, right, the split. Um, but it still has so much to do to meet its potential and to really make good in what so many of us wanted to see when that Activision split happened. I think Bungie just cannot allow themselves to continually be in the back foot and always has felt like that. So I suppose good luck to them. I hope those rewards are good and certainly... A game like Destiny, it's just hard to know what to do with it. It's such a weird genre blend. It almost feels like the end game of World of Warcraft, and then st you know stuffed into a loot shooter. Um, in terms of how they, you know, sort of, you know, you're kind of going off in these instant adventures for your weekly loot treadmill and all that stuff. I don't know, wild situation. If you're a Destiny person, hey, let me know what you think. And also, if you're a Cyberpunk uh, playing person, um, I'm going to be playing Cyberpunk for the first time shortly after this video. So I'd love to know. Uh, How's it been for you, right? What's your system config like? I've got access to a 2080 Ti, um, which is obviously a very high-end piece of kit, but uh, that's, uh, well, it'll be interesting because high-end piece of kit, but still not really a situation where I think ray tracing is going to be a very viable thing. But also I've got access to a 2060 Super, which is what we kitted out our editing rigs with at the office. So I'll be very interested to see what it runs, you know, with the 2080 Super, because or 20, sorry, 2060 Super. Because the thing there is, yeah, 3060 might be great, but you've got a snowball's chance in hell of actually getting one. So, um, yeah, I think a, a 2060 Super is, like, sort of the high end of, like, average for, uh, you know, for what, like, a decently enthused PC gamer is going to have. So I want to see what it's actually like on just some of that more common hardware. Then also, Matt on our team does have a, a 970. What a workhorse of a card, but man, I don't know if Cyberpunk is going to be doing too well for the people who are still holding out on that 970, 980 generation, like I was for so very long. There you go, though. That's it for me. Let me know what you think. I'll see you next time.